Hello and welcome to the Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Keith Gillespie of the 47th District in York County. Along with me is my colleague, Representative Stan Saylor from the 94th District. Recently, Representative Saylor and I teamed up to bring a seminar to, to our local residents. The purpose was to educate gun owners on firearm laws, including concealed carry and the Castle Doctrine. For those that were unable to attend, we thought we would invite the presenter on the program to share this important information with you. Joining us now is attorney Matthew Mengus, who practices in York and other localities. He's done quite a few of these seminars around the region. Matt, thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to come up here and share this message. You've been uh, offering a bunch of these now throughout South Central Pennsylvania. I think you said you may have been up to a dozen? Uh, more than a dozen. I've, I've lost count after that. Okay. Well, I, I know you've been giving up a lot of your Saturdays. Uh, actually, Stan and I had you down in, uh, in uh, the East Prospect area several weeks ago, and you put on a wonderful program. And, and most recently, I know you were up in Perry County, where I think you had 500 uh, attendees. Yeah, that was a big program. Yeah. And it Unfortunately, when you get a program that large, you don't get the personal one-on-one -on -one interaction, even though I know you probably were the last one out the door and answering questions. But uh, again, the purpose of the, of the program today, and again, Stan and I thank you for, for coming up here, is to try to, uh, to uh, zero in on some of those, uh, the salient points that the message that you want to get out uh, to the citizens of the community so that they're aware of the concealed weapon laws and, and other things that are associated with that. So I know um, you've had various goals, but what are some of the goals that you want to do with the uh, Concealed Weapons Seminar? Well, the biggest goal is to educate people on concealed carry law. Uh, as I've been around the Commonwealth, I've noticed that people have a lot of misconceptions, a lot of wrong ideas, just a lot of things that they've picked up along the way that you know they think it might be this way or that way. So we want to educate them as to what the law really says. Um, we don't really get political or advocate during these. It's something that we want somebody that maybe isn't comfortable about around firearms to be able to come to just to learn what the laws are if they want to know about the laws. Uh, most of the people that come out do uh, own firearms um, and so we really feel like we're helping those people have a better understanding of what their obligations and their responsibilities are if they're going to own a firearm. You know, we hear a lot about uh, about gun rights, and we you know we usually talk about the Second Amendment, but that's not necessarily something that you strictly focus on. That's right. Uh, Second Amendment is the United States Constitution, but we have uh, a little bit stronger of a constitutional provision in our state constitution at Article One, Section Twenty One, and it says the right of the citizens to bear arms in defense of themselves and the state shall not be questioned. And of course, one of the biggest differences there is it says we have the right to bear arms in defense of ourselves and makes that clear. So the, a couple of years ago, the General Assembly enacted a law to make the uniform across the state called the Pennsylvania Uniform Firearms Act. And that's where a lot of what we go over comes from. Uh, but it's important for people to know that that's not the exclusive source of law if they want to carry a weapon. Stan, I, I know uh, we've talked a lot up here about the constitutional provisions, and, and Matt certainly has hit on that. Um, uh, what type of uh, background issues, uh, Matt, might people uh, or come into play with someone uh, that would prevent someone from owning a gun? Sure, good question, and we hear a lot about that. We want to hear, make sure people that shouldn't own guns don't. Um, and let's, so let's start with some of the obvious ones. A convicted felon uh, can't own a firearm. Um, someone who is uh, in the state or the, common, or the country illegally cannot own a firearm. Um, a fugitive from justice cannot own a firearm. Uh, but we also deal with some of the uh, issues with respect to mental health, for example. Uh, if you have been involuntarily committed for mental health treatment, you can't possess a firearm. Or if you've been declared incapacitated, you can't uh, possess a firearm. And, and those are slightly different. Uh, the involuntary commitment usually refers to somebody that has, uh, at one point, has behaved in a way that led a doctor to believe they were of uh, imminent threat to themselves or to another uh, person. Somebody that's been declared incapacitated is usually somebody maybe with a brain injury or some other uh, reason why they just don't have the capacity to understand everything that goes into carrying a firearm. 
um, but we also have made provisions for people who are subject to a protection from abuse order. So if uh, somebody's engaged in domestic violence and had a protection from abuse order issued against them, they can't possess a firearm for the time that protection from abuse order uh, is in place. And there's also uh, a long list of enumerated offenses that people have been, if they've been convicted of those offenses, they can't possess a firearm. Uh, most of them deal with uh, violent offenses or deal with offenses uh, where they've had some kind of encounter with the police, uh, but among those are also drug-related offenses. So there's a, a pretty long list of people that if you know, they've uh, fallen into this category can't possess a firearm. And is it safe to say that, that most of them are probably are permanent or do some of them, I mentioned the, the protection from abuse order, that, that could have a start and, and an end. Um, it could, be, it could be temporary in nature, but something like a mental health um, a hospitalization, is, is that permanent or is that forever? It's permanent unless somebody takes action to get that undone. There is a provision that allows for certain of these restrictions to be removed and have the firearms rights restored. Uh, that is something that it, it only applies to some of these. For example, um, an involuntarily commit, uh, committed person, uh, if they have a history of stable mental health treatment uh, and a doctor can testify that they're no longer a threat to themselves or someone else, they could have that removed. But it is a court process you have to go through to get that done. Uh, Matt, one of the things that I think uh, is important for people to understand, too, are the restrictions on where you can carry a concealed uh, gun or a gun, period. Uh, could you explain that to the audience as well? Sure. Uh, we start out with the provision in the uh, Uniform Firearms Act that when you have a concealed carry license, you can carry throughout the Commonwealth. But as you said, there are places that that just doesn't apply. Uh, one of the most uh, frequent ones I see is federal property. Uh, if you go onto federal property such as the post office or a, a federal court facility, because those are federal facilities, state law doesn't apply. They don't recognize our law and our license to carry. So you can't carry in those facilities. Uh, another one is, uh, and this is one of the things I mentioned that isn't in the Uniform Firearm Act, is court facilities. You can't carry a firearm into a court facility. Uh, but uh, the General Assembly uh, saw fit to make it part of that provision that there has to be a storage facility provided uh, if, so that you can safely secure your firearm before you go into a court facility. Uh, as I talk to law enforcement officers, one of the things they say, talk about is the number of firearms that are stolen, and this is a step to make sure that people can carry and can follow the law, but make sure their firearm isn't stolen while they're in a court facility. Um, in addition, there are some uh, interesting rules with state parks. Um, you can carry in a state park if you are licensed. If you do not have a license to carry a firearm, then you have to follow the state park rules that are in effect there. Uh, and, and the last uh, one that comes confusing for people is the idea of private property. Um, a private property owner can tell you they don't want you to carry on their property and, and you must uh, follow those wishes. If you choose not to, uh, it's not a firearms violation, it is a, a, a trespass violation. So if you were to carry your concealed firearm onto private property when you've been asked not to, then you're, you're committing a trespass violation, they can ask you to leave. If you don't leave, then chances are you will uh, be visited by the police. You know, one of the things, too, that's very controversial today, and there's been a great debate about how we protect our schools, and, and could you explain to people, again, some of the controversy and, and, and your thoughts on and what is the law as far as car carrying firearms on school property? Sure. Thank you for the opportunity to do that. Um, one of the areas that's, I think, a little um, misreported or underreported is the federal gun-free school zone. We do have a federal gun-free school zone. However, there is an exception for that for somebody that is properly licensed in the state in which the school is located. So in those situations, federal law does not apply to uh, bar someone from being on school property. That said, Again, another provision that's not in the Uniform Firearm Act is a provision of the Crimes Code that makes it a crime to carry a weapon on school property. And it's not just school property, it's on the school grounds to make sure we're not talking about just the building, but also transportation to or from school, so a school bus would be covered under this same law. You can't have a weapon on school property at all. Weapons are broadly defined to include firearms, but other objects as well. 
What's interesting about this law is there is a defense for bona fide educational activities. And as I tell everybody, when I was in uh, school, we did archery in gym class. And so we had a bow and arrow as part of that. Uh, and that was not a crime for us to have that bow and arrow on school property uh, because it was part of a bona fide educational activity. The other defense that there is to having a firearm on, or a weapon on school property is that it be for other lawful purposes. And, and that's the area where there's really some um, unclear uh, ideas about things. Uh, at this point in time, we've not had uh, the Superior or the Supreme Court come down with a decision that says exactly what that means. I take the position, because we have a pretty strong constitutional provision allowing people to carry firearms for the defense of themselves, that that is another lawful purpose and that, that the defense that we're talking about here would apply. But I'm very careful to give the caveat that I'm not telling someone it's okay to go out tomorrow and carry a gun on school property. In fact, I think that would have more harm to uh, gun owners and people that want to advocate for our rights than it would do good uh, because of the atmosphere that we have today. Um, I've done the research into the legislative history when the law was passed and, and I believe that that was the intent that um, this be directed towards students and not having weapons that would cause harm on school property. Uh, I, one of the things, just a quick follow up, is that uh, a lot of people say to you, well I'm a parent, I'm dropping my child off and I had the gun under the seat or wherever. Could you quickly explain that? I know we need to take a break. Sure. Um, the idea of having the weapon on school property says it is a crime to do that. However, I know there have been situations where parents have been uh, transporting a child to or from school for whatever reason that's come out and they've not been charged. I think that's just been the good discretion of the district attorney and the police in those cases. Okay, well, that's certainly a, a, an area that uh, very controversial and a lot of ambiguity. Maybe we can get into that a little bit more in, in, in a few minutes. We're going to go ahead and take a uh, a short break, a legislative report will return in a moment. Did you know that the Pennsylvania Farm Show's history goes all the way back to 1851? Originally organized as a state fair by the Pennsylvania Agricultural Society, it was discontinued in 1899. It wasn't until 1916 that Charles Patton, the Pennsylvania Secretary of Agriculture, worked with others to develop a new agricultural fair which debuted in January 1917. It was in 1925 that the roots were laid for the farm show that we know today. The show had grown so large that 40,000 attendees were traveling to various sites all around Harrisburg. During this year, the Pennsylvania State Department of Agriculture took control of the event and the legislature had decided to appropriate money that gave birth to the Farm Show Complex. Finally, in 1931, the main exhibition building opened and welcomed 150,000 visitors to the show that year. Over the years, the Farm Show has continued to grow. Various events showcasing animals, products, and skills were added to the event. The Farm Show Complex has also continued to grow with more buildings and arenas being added over the years. The count stands at 24 acres inside 11 buildings and three arenas. Today, the show hosts approximately 6,000 animals, 10,000 competitive exhibits, and 300 commercial exhibits, along with over a half a million visitors. Since the doors to the main exhibition building opened, the Farm Show has become the world's biggest indoor agricultural event. Now you know. Welcome back to the program. I'm State Representative Keith Gillespie. With me is Representative Stan Saylor and our guest, Attorney Matt Mingus. Matt has, uh, is, a, is a local attorney in York and has provided uh, um, these uh, concealed weapons seminars uh, throughout South Central Pennsylvania, and we're very fortunate to have him. Matt, welcome back once again. Again, thanks for having me. Just before the break, we were talking about uh, uh, issues with uh, school property, and, and I was just thinking about something over the break, um, and I'm a a little bit older than Representative Saylor, but perhaps he remembers. Um, schools actually had like a rifle team as a, as a competitive sport, 
And right. I was wondering if that threw any kind of, uh, of issue in it. I think you said they still do it, but they're using BB guns. That's my understanding, yes. And, and even though they use BB guns, those are still considered weapons. Uh, the definition of weapon for this is anything that ca could cause serious bodily injury or death. And a BB gun would fall into that category. But that would fall under the defense of a, a bona fide uh, educational activity. Okay, great. Okay, um, what should folks choosing to carry a firearm know about interacting with law enforcement officers? I'm sure this is a, a, an issue that comes up uh, quite frequently from time to time. It does, and, and you know from the law enforcement officers we've had participating in these programs that they're not anti-gun and they're not there to take away people's guns, and that's important for people to understand. They're there uh, to do their job, and their goal is to go home at the end of their shift and see their family. With that in mind, uh, one of the biggest things for people to keep in mind is that they're looking at your hands. Hands are, are what hurt police officers or kill police officers. So my recommendation to people is when the officer approaches your car, you put your hands on the steering wheel, and at that point you let him know, officer, I have a concealed carry license and I have a firearm. It's located on my hip, in the glove box, wherever that might be. Uh, while I don't recommend having a firearm start in, stored in the glove box or console of a car, if you're going to do that, make sure you take the step of having your insurance and registration located in another compartment of the car so that that doesn't become an issue. At that point, the officer is probably going to tell you what, if anything, he wants you to do. Um, and that may range from, I heard one officer kind of jest, he said, well, if you don't reach for your gun, I won't reach for mine. So, you know, that gives you an idea. They're, they're not out to get us. Um, but I've also heard of situations where officers have said that they want to have the firearm taken away from the person and stored temporarily for the duration of the stop. Uh, and I think that's okay. If people are told to do that, they should cooperate with the police officer. The roadside is not a time to get into an argument about your rights, whether it's your right to carry or whatever right you have. Keith, uh, Keith and I have been you know, doing these seminars, and one of the things that a lot of people will ask is because, you know, both of our districts, we have people from Maryland moved to York County, people have moved from Philadelphia into York County, and they, they drive back and forth to work. Could you talk a little bit about the right to carry uh, and how our permanent Pennsylvania is affected by other states or other cities? Sure. We do have something called reciprocity with other states. Part of the Uniform Firearm Act is for the Attorney General to enter into agreements for us to recognize other states' licenses and for them to recognize ours. And I believe at last count there are about 28 that recognize Pennsylvania's license to carry. And there are different uh, ways that it can be done. Some of the states just don't require a license, and so they recognize ours. I would uh, encourage people to go to the Attorney General's website uh, for that information. Uh, it's just attorneygeneral.gov. Um, but uh, the important part for people to know is if they're going to go into another state with our license to carry, while our license to carry may give them that privilege, they're still subject to the other state's laws. So it's very important that they know the laws of the state they're going into. Some states' laws are uh, more strict than Pennsylvania law. In fact, we have relatively um, gun-friendly laws here in Pennsylvania compared to, for example, Texas, and this one always jumps out at me because you think of Texas as a very gun-friendly state uh, where you can't open carry in Texas or even show the print of a gun as you carry. So it's very important people know what the laws of the state that they're going into um, are. As, as far as the states that you do not recognize our license, they are subject to a federal law about the interstate transport of firearms uh, and simply uh, at, during those, in those states uh, they must unload the firearm. They must do their best to keep it out of the compartment, the passenger compartment of the vehicle, uh, both firearm and ammunition. Uh, and if you can't separate it from the passenger compartment completely, you're supposed to have it in a locked container. As long as you follow those guidelines, you should be safe uh, transporting from Pennsylvania into another state that doesn't recognize, or to a state that recognizes our license, but through a state that doesn't. Maryland doesn't recognize Pennsylvania. That's something a lot of your Countyans should know, particularly, is that carrying a concealed weapon in Maryland, yes. they don't recognize us. Yes. And, that, and that's a great point. Cause, um, you know, a lot of our folks here in this part of the state will travel through Maryland to go to the beach or maybe go to the beach in Maryland, and the same with, with Delaware and New Jersey. Um, we've talked a little bit about Maryland. What are the laws in New Jersey and Delaware for the folks that may be listening considering traveling into those adjoining states? Let me sum it up this way. The only state that borders Pennsylvania that recognizes our license to carry is West Virginia. So if you're going into Ohio, New York, 
uh, New Jersey, Delaware, or Maryland, they do not recognize our license to carry, so you will have to unload your firearm at the border. Okay. All right. So part of choosing to carry a firearm is knowing when it's appropriate to use it. And when is someone allowed to use deadly force, Matt? Well, it's a very good question. The use of deadly force is only justified when it's immediately necessary to prevent someone from uh, uh, death, serious bodily injury, kidnapping, or sexual intercourse compelled by force or the threat of force, so rape, and that the person that's using it didn't provoke an act to cause it to be used. Uh, so for example, uh, you can't uh, come at somebody with a baseball bat so that they come at you with a knife and then you can draw your firearm and shoot them. Uh, that would be provoking the act that ultimately results in the use of force. Uh, and, and again, it's important to note that the, the force must be immediately necessary. So this has to be um, one of those situations where if you don't use it now, you really feel as though you're going to be seriously injured or die. And I'm sure there's, there's a thousand situations and probably a thousand different er er answers for each one. Um, and again, maybe there was like four or five bullets there. Maybe if you can just give us those one more time. Sure. The force has to be immediately necessary to protect from death, serious bodily injury, kidnapping, or essentially rape or threatened rape. So if someone wants to kidnap my kids from me, I can use deadly force to protect my children. Okay. There was a situation, and I don't think it's been adjudicated or, or has gone through the, uh, the court system, recently here in, in the western part of the state, where uh, a young man uh, broke into a house and was threatening to rob the family. Uh, he was actually overpowered by the, the residents of the house. Um, he, he escaped out the door and then the family members, I, I you know, have all the details, but they got his weapon and they actually chased after him and then shot him as he was running through the, the back part of their property. That does not sound like that qualifies for, for some of the, because the immediate threat has been um, uh, abated uh, by the fact that the, that the perpetrator left. So to go track and hunt him down would not be an appropriate use of the deadly force. And that's a great segue to talking about the use of force in the home. Um, there is a presumption that the use of force is immediately necessary when someone has entered or is entering your home or your dwelling or is trying to remove somebody from your home or your dwelling and that for the uh, entry has been unlawful and forceful. So if they had done that while he was in the home, the presumption that they enjoy or the assumption is that they were justified in the use of force. Where they overstepped their bounds was when he was trying to get away, the, the chasing him down uh, and taking action against him then. Um, that's just not protected. It, you know, a lot of times people get stopped and they have a concealed weapon, whether it's on them or under the seat, wherever it may be, and the police officer stops you for speeding, taillights out, whatever. What's your suggestion as soon as the police officer arrives at that, that window of your car? What should the person who has a gun in their car say to the police officer do? I do recommend that you disclose to the officer that you have the firearm and where it's located. Um, again, keeping the hands on the steering wheel so they can see your hands. Whatever you do, uh, as you're, you're telling the officer you have the firearm, don't reach for the firearm to show it to them. That's not what they want to see. They want your hands in plain sight while you tell them where the firearm is, and then uh, they'll instruct you what to do from there. I know you kind of said that earlier, and I just wanted to make that clear because I think a lot of times people are very nervous when an officer, first of all, you're nervous when an officer comes to your window for whatever he's stopping you for. But I think people sometimes tend to panic saying, well, I have a gun. And even if they have a concealed weapon permit, they're very concerned about how do I react. So I'm glad you repeated that. Yeah, and again, it, when people are nervous, the other reaction they tend to have is to stick to their rights. Well, it's my right to have the gun. It's my right to have the gun. Absolutely it is. But understand a police officer just wants to go home at the end of the shift. So cooperate with him during the stop, and things will go much easier. If he does violate your rights, that's something we can adjudicate in the courtroom. The roadside isn't a place to do it. Thanks, Stan, for bringing it up. As, a, as a, the father-in-law of a, of a deputy sheriff, um, I've heard some of the stories yeah, hmm. with, with traffic stops, and uh, I appreciate the, the revisiting on that. Um, in those unfortunate situations where somebody may be forced to use deadly force uh, to protect themselves or their family members in the situations you so well described, what, what may they expect or what repercussions you know, would they may expect immediately after uh, such an event? Well, there are... Uh 
physical repercussions that you can expect. Uh, anybody that's been involved in use of force, whether it's police, military, or civilian, is going to have a physical reaction to the stress that's involved with that, feeling ill, feeling like you're having a heart attack. Uh, and it's important to know that those are going to come and to expect those uh, because that also affects how you interact with the police when they arrive. Uh, and it, it, my preference as in interacting with the police and doing defense work is that you say nothing to the police officers when they arrive and you assert your Fifth Amendment right to silence and to counsel. That said, they're going to have to conduct an investigation into what just occurred. They're showing up in a scene where somebody has a firearm, admits that they've discharged the firearm and somebody's either severely injured or dead and they've got to figure out what happened. So if when that happens that the police officer shows up, you should do four things. You should identify yourself you should identify the bad guy. This is the person that attempted to hurt me. You should exp give a brief explanation about what they did. This is the bad guy who came running at me with a knife yelling, I'm going to kill you. And then um, you should identify any witnesses that saw what happened. Uh, just like in a, a vehicle collisions, there's going to be people that come around and, and weren't necessarily there to see what happened. And you want to make sure the police get to the people that did see what happened and can talk to those people and get their uh, report before maybe they slip off outside of, uh, out of the crowd before the police can talk to them. Uh, I prefer people limit themselves to those four things. Again, yourself, identify the bad guy, what happened, and who the witnesses are and at that point simply say officer you understand this is a very serious situation and I'd like to consult with an attorney before we go any farther in this. Honestly that's the same thing that's going to happen to a law enforcement officer that's involved in use of force so I think it's reasonable that we as citizens do the same thing. Great well Matt uh, unfortunately we're out of time but I, I do want to thank you for coming up and Stan thanks for, uh, for participating in the program as well. Um, for those that may have some questions, I know there's going to be a couple of websites coming up, the NRA website and then your law firm website, and you would be available to go out to sportsmen's clubs and other organizations and speak on the same thing that you've talked about at seminars as well as what we talked about here. Correct, correct. Yeah, the NRA website is nraila.org for other states' laws if you're going to be doing interstate traveling. My website is www.trinitylaw.com, and you can feel free to contact me if you're involved in a sportsman's club. I'm happy to come out and speak. Great. Thanks again, Matt. That's all the time we have for today's program. I'm State Representative Keith Gillespie. If you have any questions about today's show or any state government matter, feel free to contact me at my local office or through my website. The information will be shown in a moment. Thanks for watching and please join me next time for another edition of Legislative Report.